in the last couple of episodes, the foundation of history are crumbling and masters of stone, I covered some pretty crazy stuff and revealed that the history of the ancient world that we've been presented with is quite different to what actually went on. Like uh, the underground city in Turkey, which looks like, judging by the erosion, could be millions of years old. And a seemingly worldwide civilization who could do incredible things with stone backed up by evidence of almost identical techniques and a testimony from New Zealand professor Barry Brailsford of the oral history of the Waitaha who described their ancient voyages and in their oral history exactly where they came from. Part 3 is going to cover some even more outrageous material. I hope you enjoy watching it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. There is evidence all over the world of continuous inhabitation by advanced species, some not even human, and some capable of feats of engineering and stoneworking far superior to humans of today. It's likely some of these are creatures of myth and legend as well as oral history, and some even seem reminiscent of creatures of the Old Testament. Some of the structures in places like Belbek, Lebanon and parts of Egypt can only possibly have been made by giants for giants. And I'm not talking about little 7, 8 foot ones, they had to have been much bigger. Unfortunately any real evidence seems to have been clouded by hoaxes, especially this infamous Photoshop competition. But fortunately, plenty of evidence does still exist in the form of old newspaper clippings and fragments of bone, which unfortunately are obfuscated as fast as they're discovered. You might have heard of the alleged cover-up of giant skeletons by the Smithsonian. Well, it turns out it's official. They've admitted to the destruction of thousands of giant human skeletons some up to 12 feet tall. Sad. And pathetic. At the other end of the scale we find evidence of dwellings, underground cities and mines which can only logically have been built by little people, for little people, reminiscent of Tolkien's dwarves. Evidence for this such as the Flores Island Hobbit has been written off as recently extinct hominids predecessors of modern homo sapiens in the Darwinian model. This totally disregards testimony of earnest natives who apparently have seen them up to recent years. Around the Ural Mountains area of Siberia, when expeditions have been sent out to find new copper deposits, Existing mines and traces of their service roads and settlements have been discovered. This was in the late 1700s when these cold remote areas had, had no known inhabitants. Four large scientific expeditions were sent out between 1805 and 1890 which established that locals had been in regular contact with these dwarves. They even traded with these dwarves who were specialists in copper working. Here we can see some of their ornaments. What made them so hard to find is they were accustomed to underground living so they didn't come out much in the day. Because of that they had highly sensitive eyes. Speaking of which, here in New Zealand before the Europeans got here there were rumours of little people. They were said to be fair skinned, even glowing, mainly fair and red haired, with blue eyes which were sensitive to the light. Coincidence? I think not. The Māoris called them the Patupayarahi. They sound quite reminiscent of the fey folk in Europe. They were said to be cheeky, mischievous and magical. And like some of the fairies we've heard about, 
uh, Patrick Payada, hey, were rumoured to have lured people away with their hypnotic flute tune. It's possible that they, having been hunted to near extinction by the Māori, needed breeding stock, so they lured women away from the village and had their way with them. Apparently they were usually sent home, but from then on they were at the beck and call of the Patrick Payarahe, who only had to play their specific flute tune, dastardly. I haven't been able to find much tangible evidence for these little people except for these coffins which were found in the Northland area and were quickly covered up. But just yesterday I found this. The silence by New Zealand authorities on our archaeological past is deafening. None more so than in the Northland Waipua Forest, where in the late 80s, a couple of million dollars was spent of taxpayers' money on an archaeological exploration which discovered evidence of an ancient civilization in a small section of this vast forest. Evidence of temples of worship, irrigation canals, stone houses, hearths and walls has been suppressed by a government order until the year 2063. The big question is, why is this information suppressed? The government must come clean on this, and we as a nation must cooperate to learn more of our past and celebrate these very early mathematicians and surveyors who are the real Tangata Whenua of New Zealand. There's obviously been Celtic people that have made it to New Zealand in the past and their culture or their art has been passed down to the Māori which seems quite obvious to most people but it's not included in our official history. It looks like some of these early New Zealand inhabitants were bred out of or you know homogenised into what we call the Māori today. The peaceful tribes probably didn't fare too well. We know some were driven inland into the more inhospitable hill country. And the one tribe which is acknowledged by the mainstream media and were probably Polynesians made their way to the Chatham Islands. But unfortunately, when the Europeans came, the Māori were able to buy muskets. And sometime in the late 1800s, a boatload of armed Māori made their way to the Chatham Islands and wiped pretty much all of them out. The Māori were at war when the Europeans got here, so it's probable that they consisted of a bunch of different tribes from different areas of the Pacific, of the world even. The more warlike ones stayed at war and basically wiped the rest out. The Māori got here from the Pacific Islands in outrigger canoes, but there seems to be a bit of a Norse or Celtic influence on the Māori waka that we see today, who at some point lost their outrigger as they didn't need to leave the country, they didn't need sails or extra stabilisation. They were more built for the coastlines and some of our larger rivers around which they predominantly settled. The Patrick Payadahe were said to have built their canoes out of flax reeds, which reminds me of the reed boats that were used in Lake Titicaca as well as in Egypt. The similarities between some of these craft is undeniable and I don't think anyone in their right mind can deny it. there was some worldwide seafaring civilization. 
as can also be seen in the amazing megalithic masonry. So how was that made? They most often built with rocks with a high crystal content like granite or quartzite or some types of limestone. Nikola Tesla once said, in a crystal we have the clear evidence of the existence of a formative life principle and though we cannot understand the life of a crystal, it is nonetheless a living being. Uh, there's plenty of evidence, well anecdotal, of the healing power of crystals, written off as pseudoscience by the mainstream of course. But they seem to forget that quartz crystals have been used for decades in clocks and watches as they'll indefinitely vibrate at a measurable frequency. And then there's silicon crystals used in microchips, as well as ruby crystals which are used as a part of a laser to focus and concentrate the energy. In the Book of Stones by Robert Simmons and Naisha Ashyam, it is stated that when we bring the crystal into our electromagnetic field, two things occur. The electromagnetic frequencies carried by the stone will vibrate with related frequencies in our own energy field through the physical law of resonance, creating a third larger vibration field. The nervous system is attuned to these shifts in energy and transmits this information to the brain. Here the frequencies stimulate biomechanical shifts that affect the body and shift brain function. So I think it's safe to assume that the ancients knew about the power of crystals. To this day, royals wear crystals in their crowns, so coincidence? I'm guessing probably not, whether they know about it these days or not. In recent years, scientists and inventors have been experimenting with acoustic levitation, whereby three or four loudspeakers are pointed to a center point where the object you want to levitate is and they produce a standing wave. So far this has only been successful on smaller objects, but I'm guessing, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling that if we were to incorporate crystals, find the resonant frequency of the crystal in rock for instance, Using similar methods, we might have to experiment with different frequencies of sound, uh, maybe go a whole lot higher or lower than has been tried so far. But it's speculated that that could be how some of these massive polygonal structures were built back in the day. Contemporary mad scientist John Hutchison performs similar levitation, but instead of using sound energy, he uses electrical energy by pointing two Tesla coils at the subject. I'm guessing it's a similar principle using a standing wave of electrical energy, but don't quote me on that one. Now, where it gets really interesting is he actually manages to change the composition of matter. So you can see solid metal objects melting and warping. And so what I'm wondering is, can you do the same thing with stone? Stone with the high quartz content. Match up the resonant frequencies and maybe not only can you levitate stone, but also soften it. There's a lot of evidence on ancient megalithic structures of rock which has been softened and then basically carved or molded like clay. Evidence for this is all over the place. It really looks like the stones were softened in place, kind of squished together so it's, it looks seamless. 
Like, seriously, imagine doing this manually with hammers and chisels. The concept is just crazy. Like, to me, that is much crazier than these alternatives I'm exploring here. But if that's still too far-fetched for you, there is even evidence around that granite used to be soft at one point. We all know about the infamous dinosaur footprints with human tracks sort of going in between them, like they were made at exactly the same time, and they probably were. Geologists will tell you this is impossible and it must be fake because, well, it's just not how granite forms, but we have the evidence. Like, look at these so-called cart tracks in Malta. We're looking at hard granite, which obviously was once some sort of soft, muddy or clay-like material. So, an interesting theory, but in that case, how would the soft megalithic structures have stayed intact this long and subsequently hardened? I think it explains the cut ruts and the tracks and this giant footprint made famous by Michael Tellinger, but not the polygonal masonry. And speaking of giants, say there were people around that were, you know, 18, 24 feet tall, you wouldn't need levitation to move these giant stones. I mean, maybe the dozen ton ones that we find used at Baalbek. That could be a bit of a stretch, but, you know, these two to 60, 100 ton ones even, that'd be pretty easy for a bunch of giants of that stature. But I'm guessing they used both methods. If the giants didn't have this levitation technology or the stone softening technology, maybe they did have some pretty amazing power tools. Sounds crazy, but check this out. This is obviously what we would know as modern tool marks, you know, like a circular saw blade. Like, it's unmistakable. This is Turkey, but, you know, we see similar evidence in parts of Egypt. So maybe they were electrical. We all know about the Giza power plant theory and we've all probably seen these giant light bulbs which were probably used to light the pyramids as there's no trace of soot build up. They had to be lighting it somehow and I'm thinking that the standard explanation by the quackademics in which a series of golden mirrors were used to reflect lights deep down the passages is a complete bunch of crap. So they probably did have electric lighting and then why not electric tools? The amazing thing is that these tools were technologically far superior to anything that we use these days. And they did a better job too. Some of these flat surfaces are to a tolerance that we wouldn't even bother with these days. Like these so-called giant sarcophagi. They're insane. The top and bottom made out of single pieces of stone, polished to something like one two thousandth of an inch tolerance. We don't even know how they got them in there, let alone made them in the first place. And there's evidence of use of circular saw type plates, which were much finer and much larger than ones that we can produce today and capable of withstanding a much greater force. So they obviously had the technology. Oh, and we're not even getting into the ancients' use of geopolymers, the most obvious of which is even documented, the Roman concrete, which is still holding up over millennia. Well, you know, according to the standard chronology. In the not-so-ancient Khmer Kingdom of Cambodia and Myanmar, we see what looks like polygonal blocks made out of 
softened stone geopolymer, which is built around standard bricks. So obviously there was some sort of transitional period between the polygonal masonry, possibly made out of softened stone and or geopolymer. I showed a similar but even more baffling amalgamation of technology in part two in Cappadocia, Turkey. Here we see what looks to be a geopolymer plaster type facade and at the bottom you can see what looks to be stones or bricks and mortar with the geopolymer facade over it and it's also kind of stuck onto the bedrock. It looks to be a similar sort of technology used in Petra, Jordan. We're told this is all cut out of bedrock but is it? You can see it's a slightly lighter colour than the bedrock and a lot more consistent and well it's just impossible to carve with that sort of precision. It looks to be moulded and the way it's sort of stuck onto the rock face is incredible. You can see um, in places it's almost peeling off and take a look at the scale of this place. It's just insane and some bits look to be maybe thousands of years older than others uh, with some serious erosion you can see like in Cappadocia you've got rooms that are just open to the elements because it looks like the whole rock face has just crumbled away and some of it's got that soft organic look to it from what looks to be water erosion or sand erosion possibly. According to the official narrative, Petra was founded by Nabataeans who were nomads and it was only inhabited between about 300 BC and 300 AD. But just a quick glance at these photos completely destroys that narrative. Obviously, like the underground cities of Cappadocia, this goes back much further. And most likely it's been inhabited by a lot of different people. So there's definite similarities to the underground city of Derinkuyu, which I showed at the start of the video. But what might surprise you is that there's similar underground cities or networks of tunnels in Bulgaria, Iran, India, Italy, Spain, China, Switzerland, Georgia, Syria, Romania, Afghanistan. I could go on, but for more details, check out www.megaliths.org. It's got a lot of amazing stuff on it, which is where I found a lot of the material I used in these videos. So gotta give her the things she deserves. And definitely check out her YouTube channel, which is called New Earth. There's a link below.